Okay guys, welcome to the third in the Shark series tutorials. Uh, so far we've done the basic game in tutorial one, and we've done the animation of the shark in uh, tutorial two. In tutorial three, we're going to talk about how to add multiple fish, and how to make their swimming patterns a little bit more advanced, and how to save you a lot of time in your coding by using procedures as well. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention about procedures, you may notice that sometimes an animation procedure like this, for example, might not be open um, by default when you open your program. Some of you have figured that out already, that the way you can bring it back is to go under the uh, object, so in this case the shark, and just to click on the folder for the animation. So if you ever lose any of these tabs here at the top, that's how you bring them back, by just clicking down on this drop down menu. Okay, so let's go back to my first method and see what we have left here. Now, ideally, you don't want a whole lot. Um, if we add multiple fish here, and let's say every fish has a pattern like this, you can imagine that's going to be a lot of code. And this is going to get to be a very confusing program to follow very quickly. So we may want to make sure that we do everything as a procedure. We have a basic fish moving. And here what he's doing is he's moving forward all the time by three. And then if the next random Boolean is true, so if this happens to be true, then he will turn left by 90 degrees. And if it happens to be false, he'll turn right, which creates a random swimming pattern on a horizontal plane. Um, but what if we want him to go vertical as well, up and down? So you could think about that. I'm going to give you like one suggestion here today of what you could do, but it's not, by any means, this is not the best swimming pattern. There are ways, if you put some thought into it, that you can make this even better and even more random. So I could throw a nested if statement now into what I already have and set it to true for now. And then change this again to next random boolean. Okay, so maybe I'm going to have him turn uh, left if it's true, and if it's not, I'll have him actually move up. So let's go to the clownfish, and let's do a move direction, okay, and we'll have him go up by one meter. All right, so maybe now I throw another if into here, and I set it to true, but I actually change it to next random boolean. So here, if this happens to be true, maybe I have him go, uh, let's say, down by one meter. All right. And if not, I have him turn right. So if you follow the logic here now, there's he can basically go in any direction, uh, left, right, up, or down. And this is going to make the game a little bit more complex, the swimming pattern a little bit more sophisticated. Because now it's going to look, if it's true, Okay, then he's going to go forward, or well true is true, he's going to go forward, so he's always going to do that. If this is true, then it's going to look in here. If this is true, it's going to do that. If it's not, it's going to do that. If this isn't true, it's going to go here. If this is true, it's going to do that. If it's false, it's going to do that. So all we've done so far is kind of played around with the animation, uh, the swim pattern on the clownfish. So let's go ahead and set this all back to the clownfish, um, just so we can see if this is working and if he ever does swim up or down. So I'm going to change this all back to the clownfish for now, just so we can test this. I'm just going to get rid of this piece of code altogether. Okay, now let's go ahead and run that. All right, so there he goes. So we can see he did a left turn there, another left turn swimming through caves okay boom down and underground okay so this is as good a time as any to talk a little bit of collision detection uh, i don't want the fish to be able to go underground but i don't know if he's going to or not it really depends what these are randomized to um, if he gets enough of the trues on this level he is going to move down and he's going to move down until he gets underground so let's talk about collision detection because by default in alice nothing has collision detection. It might look like a cave should be solid to you, but Alice doesn't treat the cave as solid. So because we don't know when he's going to hit the ground, we're not going to program this into my first method. My first method is for things that have a predictable outcome. Um, initialized event listeners are for things that could collide in the world when we don't know when it's going to happen. Uh, it's for when the user presses a button, any of those things that are kind of more unpredictable 
are done in the initialize event listeners. So we could do a collision start listener. And uh, to do this, we go to add event listener. We say, uh, let's go down to position orientation and add a collision start listener. It's listening for two arrays. And those arrays are the clownfish and the ground. OK, so here's my new collision start listener. Don't worry about these things up here. Uh, this is the new listener that it's listening for. And what's, what do I actually want to have happen if the clownfish makes contact with the ground? Well, I want to move the clownfish upwards. And I could just do even 10 to kind of clear them away from the ground. That's going to be quite a ways, uh, but that's fine. And it's always going to listen to this now. Now, you can bet I might also want to do that with uh, the cave, because right now we can swim through the cave. So you can imagine what the collision start listener would look like for that. I would go back here. I would add an event listener, position orientation, collision start, custom array, custom array. And I would choose, again, the clownfish. And as the second thing, I would choose the cave. All right. Now, I'm not going to get this complex for now, but think about this logically. We know the direction the fish always hits the ground. He's always coming down, and he hits it. So it was easy to send the fish back up. Now, if you think about it with the cave, do we always know how he hits the cave? We know he could hit it from the front. We know he could hit it by going down. There's at least a few. He doesn't swim backwards, so we don't have to worry about that. But there's at least a few ways that that could happen. The simplest thing would be to just send him up or to send him back by 10 every time, no matter what. That would definitely clear him from the cave, and that's acceptable. There are actually really complex ways, if you want to think about this, to know if he's hitting it from the top or from the front and to give him different collision uh, based on how he hits it. But that's for another time because that's more complex than I want to get right now. So let's go back to my first method. Now we have this fish now swimming in random patterns. Happy with that. The clownfish is working. Here's what I'm challenging you to do with this game. You will get an OK mark if you have one fish and you have this working. But you're going to get a much better mark if you have a challenging game with multiple fish. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into my scene setup. And uh, just for sake of time here, I'm just going to throw in a couple other fish. All right, I'm going to throw in the blue tang. And I'm going to throw in a carp. Now, why are you getting more credit for more fish? And I'll tell you why right now. Because when you make this game, it's not that hard to make a game where if the shark catches the fish, boom, the game's over, the user wins. It's way more challenging to make a game where you have multiple fish, and you have to think about the logic of, have I caught all the fish? Have I won the game? Catching two of the, fi two of the three fish, not good enough. Have I caught all three? Okay. Now, the reason that's more complicated is because we need variables. You guys probably used variables in Scratch last year if you made a game. Uh, I'm going to leave variables to the next tutorial. And that's probably the most difficult but interesting concept in all of programming. If you understand variables, you can do almost anything. I'm going to leave that to the next tutorial, though, because we're already at nine minutes on this one. Uh, and again, what the point of this one is, is how to get the fish to swim randomly. So here's the first thing I'm going to tell you we've got a clownfish. We've got a swimming pattern, let's make use of that. Let's not do this again uh, two other times for the other fish. OK, so you guys learned about procedures in an earlier tutorial. We're going to make a procedure for the blue tang. We're going to call it uh, blue tang swim. No spaces as always. OK, boom, that's going to pop up here. I'm going to take my my first method. I'm going to right click on it. I am going to copy it to the clipboard. I'm going to go to my blue tang. Oops, blue tang swim. I'm going to drag it from the clipboard to here. OK, almost done. We just have to change the clownfish to this. 
Now we don't change it to this blue tang because we're already in the blue tang's procedures. It already knows we're talking about the blue tang. But I'm going to change all of these to this. And then my final thing to do is to go back to my first method. We already have a do together. So what I want to do is drop to the blue tang. And I want to do that new procedure in with my other ones. Now, how much less code is that, right? And this is what professional programmers do. They do everything as procedures, everything as my blocks, as separate areas that can be called. That way it can be used multiple times. Let's set all of this back to the blue tang so we can see if this is working. And we'll run the program. Okay, it does look like both fish are moving and he has a random pattern to him. So, so far, so good. Uh, and there he goes underground. Because again, I haven't set collision on him. We would have to go back to the event listeners and set a collision listener for that, right? Okay. Let's do the same thing for the carp. Carp swim. Now, we could take the blue tang swim here, and we could just copy this to the clipboard and bring it to the carp. And we just have to make sure this all says this, which it does. So it knows it's talking about the carp. Go back to my first method. Drop down to the carp. Take that procedure. Add it to our others. Set this all to the carp now. And watch our program run. Okay. So far, so good. And I can actually see the other fish moving there too in the background. So I've got all three working. I think the final thing that you'd want to do is make a procedure for the clownfish. We might as well completely clean up this code. Clownfish swim. And we're going to take the carp swim. Copy it to the clownfish. It already says this, so that's fine. Go back to our my first method. Now we can safely remove this, right? No longer needed. And simply add for the clownfish the procedure that says clownfish swim. Okay. And we'll go back and set this to the clownfish. And here to the clownfish. And let's take a look. There we go. All three fish swimming. One of them has collision. The other two don't. I'd have to add that. Um, but basically, very happy with this because what we've done, completely random pattern to all of our fish, and look how much code it actually takes up in our my first method. So very organized now. The only other thing I'd tell you to do is uh, for level four credit, these comments here, um, adding them. Again, this is always going to give you more credit. All a comment does is say something like this. The following procedure calls the shark animation. Okay, so that's an example. We just explained with an English sentence what's happening in the following line. You could do the same thing for like this. Uh, the following procedure calls a random fish swimming pattern for the blue tang. Okay, that's an example of what you would do. The more comments you have in your code, the better. They take a second to put in. And that's again so somebody who just comes and sits down can understand your code. All right, so I did that in under 15 minutes. I'm happy with that. That is one of the more complex things you can do in this game to, and a way to really stay organized. So, like I said, the next tutorial, we're going to look at variables um, because that's how you're going to make conditions on how to win or lose the game, which any good game has. Okay, so thanks for watching. Uh, good luck with that, and let me know if you need any help.